Good evening. I'm going to talk to you a little bit. I've been asked to talk about um, how, I, how I formed Photo Kids and why I did. Um, this is Marta, and she was five years old when I met her in Guatemala City's sprawling garbage dump. I just left my job um, working as a combat photographer, uh, covering the wars in Central America for Reuters News Agency. And um, the fact that I then decided to move to Guatemala, which was another co country involved in a brutal civil war, in order to chill out um, shows that I wasn't really playing with a full deck. <laughs> then I started uh, teaching kids in the garbage dump um, photography in a project that I never imagined would last 20 years. The the original seed for this project started when I'd heard that there was a ghost town in El Salvador that was entirely populated by child soldiers, by kids, guerrilla kids. And so my friend Mary Jo and I, who was a reporter, um, decided to go down there and check it out. And we were met at the entrance with um, kids with AK-47s and walkie-talkies. And as I was taking pictures, um, the girls, you know, she'd pegged her pants and she was holding the flowers, posing for the photos and the boys posing with their AK-47s. And, but then listening to them talk, um, they were kids, you know? And they took the newspaper that we brought with them, and, with us, and laid it on the, uh, on the hood of the VW that we'd come in, and they were busy looking at the movie section. And I was, I was listening to them talk, and they were going like, oh my God, look, there's one with helicopters in it, wow. And I said, you know, have you guys ever, ever been to the movies? And they said, no, but we'd go if you take us. <laughs> and Mary Jo goes, don't even think about it. But I did think about it. And I thought, you know, what's going to happen with these kids when the war's over? They have no basis for dialogue between, between the group that lived in the mountains, um, worked with the guerrillas, and the kids in the city that um, never had a chance, to, uh, these kids never had a chance to go to school never had any of the advantages that the kids in the city had. And so I thought, you know, at least the older generation had all interacted before they started killing each other. But now these kids had, had absolutely nothing in common. In 1989, I'd been working, um, uh, covering the wars for six years. And I was paid um, uh, combat pay. I was paid extra for it. And um, I, can, I think I can modestly say that I earned it. Um, uh, I was shot at numerous times and had to, I took lots of pictures of massacres and um, um, even had two of the, the people that I had trained, two of the young men, um, shot and killed by the, by the military. So um, it made me very angry. And of course, you know when you're angry, um, you're not really thinking straight, and you not only put yourself in danger, but you put other people in danger. So I knew it was time to leave. Um, but it was very difficult to leave. Um, this was a job that um, I put my heart into. Um, I, 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 I think one of the main reasons that I left was that I was always taking pictures, and I was always running, and I was saying, you know, um, and these, these pictures went around the world. Um, Reuters had like 10,000 clients. And I was thinking, God, you know, can somebody do something about this? Because I, I have to run and take the next picture. And so then I began to think, well, is there anything I could do? Mm. Well, what kind of skill do I have? Well, I never thought photography because, um, you know, it's too expensive, especially then when we were using film. And to what end? What would I do with it? Um, this was one of the pictures I took that, was a girl in New Year's Eve party. <laughs> and the thing was, I decided to leave, get move to Guatemala and do things that had to do, maybe involve myself with a community and do pictures that didn't have to do with war. But I have to tell you, it was a really, really difficult transition because I was living alone for the first time in many years. I didn't have my colleagues with me. Um, I had too much time to think and replay all the ugly images of war. So I figured that the only way I could probably pull myself out of it was to get involved in something outside of myself. And um, when I first went down to Guatemala City's garbage dump, it was on assignment for an Australian magazine. And as you can see here, um, uh, basic building materials were um, uh, tin, cardboard, 
I used um, mattress springs as fences. The sewage ran um, right through the middle of the, the houses that people had. And there were 3,500 people living in the garbage dump. 1,500 of them were kids. And all the kids were following me and wanted to see through my camera lens. And I began to wonder, you know, what would the pictures be like if they were taking it through their lens instead of myself. So I became involved with the community and, um, and started visiting them and doing all these other things. And um, uh, I met two nuns that uh, were working in the dump. Um, one had worked with Cesar Chavez and the other had owned a uh, bathing suit boutique in Trinidad, Tobago. <laughs> and I got to be friends with them. And, um, uh, one of them had a heart attack, and I had been thinking of doing a project giving street kids photography, and she said to me, oh my God, if you could take my class, my literacy class, and teach these kids something, it'd be great. They're never going to have a chance to go to school, um, and all they need is a little stimulation. They're very bright, and so I decided to do that, and I had no idea it would become my vocation or that hundreds of kids would pass through this project. And, um, you know, I, I thought I would do it probably for six months. And I remember my mom saying to me, you know, you're taking on an awful responsibility. And I thought, you know, what is she talking about? So this was the original group. And when I looked at this group, I thought, oh, my God, what am I doing? Look at the size of these kids. They're so small. And, um, and you know, there was lots of aha moments in here that I didn't really realize what I was doing. I wanted to see um, what I could see through their eyes, but um, I had no idea beyond that. I wasn't an educator, so um, I mean, I'd, I'd worked with kids and teach workshops, but I, I really thought that I would do it for six months. But within the first week, it was incredible. I couldn't wait to get into the dark room to develop the film. They took pictures of everything. Now, I, I've been a photo editor for Reuters. These guys are really good. I knew they were good. And um, they took pictures of their aunt reaching for glue to inhale. They took pictures of the, the clothes their dad had thrown around in anger when he was drunk so that they could show it to him when he was sober. <laughs> they took pictures of their little brother crying because their parents were fighting. No censorship. These kids carried their cameras with them everywhere and took pictures of everything. And, of course, happy pictures, too, <laughs> of, of um, you know, the dance at his childhood. And it was one of those aha moments after I started teaching them that I realized that, you know, I could get them to not only um, talk about their pictures, but then I could get them to write about their lives and get them excited about learning and actually um, encourage them to dream. This is Marta, um, and she's uh, loading film in the camera there. And she was so tiny, she was the tiniest one, that she would come up to you. And um, we, we actually um, shared cameras. We shared three cameras, and each kid got 12 um, shots apiece. And she would come up to you and throw her head back. And, um, and when I would look at the contact sheets, I'd go, there were like a string of these. And I'd go, what is this? And of course, that's all Marta saw was the waistlines. <laughs> <laughs> And so I thought, well, that's kind of avant-garde. <laughs> this is like Marta's New York style. <laughs> but you know, within about a month or so, she really picked it up. She started to use flash fill. <laughs> and um, I'll just show you some of the pictures that she took. That's where they left. That's her mom changing the baby in the background. So, you know, I can't encapsulate 20 years, but um, just to tell you how it had sort of originally started, Kanaka Japan um, found out about us and asked if they could sponsor us for um, a year and a half with a show in Tokyo. So um, they gave us all the, the photo materials, and then after we had the show in Co Tokyo, we were on the cover of an arts, performing arts magazine, and the Brit saw us and came over and did two half-hour programs um, for a children's art program. And, and we had a, at the same time, we had an exhibit at the Photographer's Gallery in London. And so I ended up taking Marta and Gladys to England. 
That's Marta at the inauguration with that bouquet. It was as big as she was. And we had our first tele uh, television interview, and they asked her, um, well, she, didn't, she wouldn't speak through the whole thing, you know, not, nothing. And it, Gladys did all the speaking. And at the very end, they said to her, um, so um, does anyone have anything to add? And she said, yeah, I do. You know, when I went in the plane, I couldn't believe it. The bathroom was so small. And you went in there, and then when you flushed the toilet, it made the sound like whoosh. And I thought it was going to suck me right out of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was just stunned. <laughs> this uh, uh, little girl from the dump um, was a valedictorian of her high school class. And she, um, she gave this, the valedictorian speech. Um, the kids had come to me, and they asked me to put them in school. And this was another aha moment. I mean, this was in the very beginning. I'd made $150. And when I asked them what I should do with it, they said, put us in school. And so then I made that also um, a backbone of the project. And they had to stay in school to stay in the project. Um, in her address, um, in her, she talked about um, all the publications that she'd been in and the exhibitions. And they were numerous. Um, She's shown alongside. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she was able to take Barbie and put it into her um, into her life <laughs> as she knew it. Um, so she's she's been in you know anthologies in Guatemala. Uh, Guatemala. She's been in um, um, shows with Sebastián Salgado. She's been. Um, and just, just been all over. I mean, she's been in 25 publications. Um, this is a book that we published, and many of her photographs were in it. The next thing that happened was in 1996, Guatemala signed their peace accords, and they ended a 36-year brutal civil war that killed over 200,000 indigenous. And that's when I began to think, you know what? We have the exact same situation here that we had in El Salvador with the guerrilla kids. Let's get the kids from the city who didn't even know there was a war going on and the children ha who um, were in the mountains that had been fleeing the army for 12 years, um, kids that have, had, had witnessed massacres, and let's get them all together and let's have them talk and, and discuss this. And um, then I had another moment where um, I decided, well, and let's have the kids teach. So my city kids that were in sixth grade um, taught the fourth graders. And they taught them photography. And then each, each um, month when we would bring the, the kids down from all the different areas, um, they would also they'd have a teaching workshop beforehand. And then they, they would teach. Um, so they did stories. Um, they took testimonies of their, from their neighbors and from um, um, uh, their family, they started out with their family first, and from, um, they wrote then short stories, poetry, um, illustrated things about their culture. I had to actually wait um, two years in Santiago Atitlan, an Indian village on the shores of, of the lake, waiting for um, uh, the kids to bring up the war. This is, because um, I didn't want to go in there and just go, well, let's talk about the war. <laughs> And um, the kids went out with the Reuters photographers and took pictures of the last people coming down from the mountains. And I had them, you know, uh, write about the stories that they'd heard. Um, things like um, um, oh, the, when the massacre happens, people hiding in caves. And, um, but then they'd have to put um, their hands over the baby's mouth so that when the army went by, they wouldn't, hear the they wouldn't hear the babies crying and give away the location of everybody in the cave. And several of the babies had suffocated, and the mothers were, were dealing with an incredible amount of, of guilt. I've had four um, kids murdered. Um, I, I never thought that would happen with um, uh, running a children's program. Uh, it was just like being back in the war again. And um, the first one was deliberately drowned by somebody in the dump. And, and then um, just last um, October, a minor was um, shot by a gang five times in the face. Um, the, well, we've moved out of the dump now, and we're working in all the gang areas, which is really where we're needed. Um, the violence is incredible in Guatemala. It's up to at least 17 uh, murders a day. We have more than Iraq, actually. Um, the kids have all seen, um, 
the fact they've all have seen people, they've certainly have seen people dead, but they've actually seen people killed. The little kids' classes seen, were out taking pictures when um, somebody ran by and killed somebody else. So, um, um, the, uh, they live in fear. They live in almost constant fear. And, and I'm sure kids here do as well in Oakland and other places. It's, uh, it's the same. It's pretty universal. But it's a pretty hard way to grow up. And, um, you know, one of the kids, Aura, her, her brother's like number one in um, one of the big gangs in Guatemala. He's in prison now. And, um, but her family's just been haunted by it. They've had to drive by shootings. They've had to move houses several times. And last month, somebody, um, uh, two hitmen, came to the school looking for her. So we're dealing with lots of emotion. And I, I really don't even have to, the compassion level is pretty high. These are the kids teaching the other kids. And that's one thing that they, they all participate in and really want to do as a payback. Um, Rosa, they, the kids are, are well, they're, they're my treasure, really, because they've taken over every role in the, in the organization from administration to they have their own design studio, and, <clears throat> and they're all the teachers. And um, when Rosa was teaching, she comes back and she goes, I didn't know what to say. I asked them what was the best thing and what was the worst thing about their lives, and they said, um, one little boy said, well, you know, I came home from school, and um, it was dark inside the house, and I, I, when I could see, I, could, I saw that my mother had hung herself. And I thought, well, how could she do that? How, how could she leave me all alone? Didn't, didn't she know I loved her? So, um, you know, what we've got sort of is a um, compassion pyramid, actually, of kids teaching kids and responding to them. And, you know, I guess that's what it's all about. It's like first you see, then you understand, you empathize, and then hopefully you're moved to action. And um, that's, you know, what I say to them. And, and the message that I try to give them is, you know, see what your gift is. It doesn't have to be photography. Um, then figure out how you can use that skill. And um, then, you know, it doesn't have to be a big numbers game. You don't have to do it with with 20 kids. You think how the world would be different if we each gave a heart or a hand to just one person. And then the most important thing is, is not, it's not enough to feel compassion, but you actually have to act and do something about it and take it on. Thank you.